So today we are going to talk about overall transformation kinetics. That means uh, when we take account of nucleation, growth and lots of things happening from different locations inside the same material. And uh, we have looked at time temperature transformation diagrams. When we are designing new steels, uh, it is uh, useful to be able to calculate these diagrams, okay, so that you can vary the chemical composition and so forth the austenite grain size etc and calculate the diagrams rather than measure them because you can go through a vast range of uh, alloy compositions etc on a computer than you can do experimentally. So I will go briefly through the theory for calculating these uh, time temperature transformation diagrams. We have dealt with all aspects of the growth of these uh, major phase transmissions that occur in steels. Um, so in order to calculate a time temperature transmission diagram we need a nucleation theory okay? uh, and uh, growth theory we have dealt with and hard impingement is when particles which are nucleated from different locations uh, collide with each other, uh, they touch each other and therefore interfere with each other's growth and what is soft impingement? As even strain fields, yeah, strain fields, diffusion fields, thermal fields begin to overlap. Now we haven't actually dealt with that, okay? So let's let's just think about uh, how we might handle soft impingement. Uh, so soft impingement, when two particles are growing towards each other and their diffusion fields start to overlap, uh, analytical solutions are almost impossible except for very simple situations. But if you uh, implement the equations numerically then at every stage you can modify the composition in the matrix uh, due to the partitioning. Yeah? So it is it's almost trivial to take account of it by simply modifying the composition of the matrix uh, at every stage of the transformation and you can make the increment of transformation as small as possible depending on how much accuracy you want. Okay? So, Soft impingement is not difficult to take account of, but we uh, analytical solutions are very, very difficult except for the simplest of scenarios. Okay, so we need uh, all of these features in order to calculate a time temperature transformation diagram. Um, so imagine that we've got these two particles which have nucleated obviously at different times because they have uh, grown to different sizes. Uh, they will eventually touch and that is what we call hard impingement and soft impingement is when the far field composition uh, in the case of solute fields uh, actually changes because you are pumping solute into the matrix. So here for example uh, we are no longer uh, at the constant C bar that we have assumed in all our growth theory. Okay, is everyone happy with that? Right. Uh, you have dealt with uh, nucleation theory many times before, um, I am just going to go through it very briefly now. So why is it that we need nucleation at all, why should we, why does not a phase simply start growing? Okay, so um, when you create a new phase you have actually got to have an interface between the parent and the product phase. Now why does that present a barrier to nucleation? Uh, it's it's you're on the right track, okay? Um, what? It, yeah. That's That's exactly right. So, when you have a small particle, the surface to volume ratio is large. So the interfacial energy dominates the formation of the particle and initially the cost of creating the interface is greater than uh, can be accommodated by the chemical driving force. So why should that embryo form at all? You know if, if the free energy change is positive 
then why should it form at all? So imagine that we are observing uh, a parent austenite grain at high temperature. Um, and these processes of nucleation are giving rise to an increase in free energy, then why should, why should there be any attempts to nucleate? That would reduce, uh, if you nucleate heterogeneously, that would reduce the cost of nucleation, but it's still there, the barrier is still there. That's, that's the key. Uh, so when you've got uh, atoms at a high temperature, there will be random fluctuations uh, and some of those fluctuations will tend to be the correct crystal structure and composition for your product phase. So these random heterophase fluctuations, if they manage to get beyond the critical size of the nucleus, then they develop into a nucleus. Okay? To understand nucleation, if we observe the parent phase, parent phase with sufficient time and spatial resolution, sufficient time and spatial resolution, we would see that thermal fluctuations thermal fluctuations lead clusters of atoms atoms by pure chance to adopt the structure and composition of the product adopt the structure and composition of the product phase. Now these clusters can only develop into a particle which grows if the fluctuation is greater than the critical size uh, given by the nucleation theory. So these clusters can only grow into viable particles if their size exceeds G star, um, sorry, R star from of a nucleation equation. So these fluctuations are known as heterophase fluctuations. These are heterophase fluctuations. So effectively, we are relying on random fluctuations uh, to see whether clusters of atoms exceed the critical size beyond which there is a reduction in free energy of the system. And therefore, you have a viable nucleus which grows into a macroscopic particle. So if you look at uh, this diagram and uh, we've got uh, free energy curves for alpha and gamma and there's a transition temperature where those two curves cross, we will not actually see alpha forming at exactly that temperature because we'll have to undercool in order to account for any strain energy term. So here we are assuming a spherical nucleus and the surface energy term which scales with R squared. And R cubed is smaller than R squared when R is very uh, small. 
and therefore the surface energy term will dominate. The chemical free energy change here is simply the difference between the parent and the product phases. So we end up with, uh, if I plot that curve for delta G, then I end up with a barrier to nucleation and that barrier has to be surmounted by thermal fluctuations, all right? So thermal fluctuations which locally change the structure and composition into the right configuration by pure chance. Uh, and uh, if you take that equation and you differentiate it with respect to the size, then uh, set that to zero, then you find that the critical uh, size of the particle will vary with uh, interfacial energy, directly with interfacial energy and inversely with the chemical driving force. So uh, if you have more driving force, then you only require a small fluctuation to get uh, to a successful nucleus. And if you have a large interfacial energy, you will require a huge fluctuation before you start to get a decrease in free energy. And this, this uh, height of the activation barrier, which you get similarly by setting the differential to zero, it's important to note that G star varies with the cube of the interface energy. So it's very, very sensitive to interfacial energy. And that's why we often get metastable precipitation reactions. So for example, in aluminum alloys, you don't end up with uh, aluminum copper alloys. You don't end up with uh, Al2Cu directly, but you get these, uh, do you remember what you get? These GP zones. GP zones, yeah, which are coherent. They're not the most stable, but their interface energy is smaller, and therefore they're the first to form. Okay, so that's a, a summary of uh, nucleation theory, which you've done uh, many times before. And once we get the activation energy, all we have to do is to plug it into an Arrhenius-type equation to get the probability of successful uh, nucleation. So if G star is the barrier, then the chance of uh, a cluster getting over the barrier is simply exponential minus G star upon KT. Uh, that is an attempt frequency. Uh, you could take it as the d by frequency, you know, which is 10 to the 13 per second. Uh, and uh, NV is the number of nucleation sites per unit volume. Okay. That term at the end, exponential minus Q upon KT, um, is the barrier to the transfer of atoms across the interface. So that's a constant value, whereas G star will vary with undercooling, etc. Okay? So that is our nucleation rate per unit volume. I is the nucleation rate and V, the subscript V, indicates it's the nucleation rate per unit volume. Everyone happy with that? Okay, so um, now we get to um, a problem which was uh, addressed first by Avrami and uh, various other people that look you've got particles which are starting from different locations how do we actually allow for the fact that eventually they are going to touch each other well Amra Avrami came up with the idea that let's first calculate uh, the total volume fraction assuming that particles can grow through each other can nucleate in each other even if there are, there are those regions have actually transformed and then correct that to get the real volume fraction. Okay, so I'll, I'll go into that now. So this is an example of a glass devitrifying and you can see that once the particles start to touch they change their shapes etc. In this case there is no chemical composition change but certainly the entire growth process changes once they start to touch each other. So it's not a, not a trivial thing uh, to handle, uh, but there is a simplification we can make. So imagine that we have two particles existing at a time t, and then a short time later they both uh, grow. So the dark blue uh, region is where we've had growth. And during that time interval, we might also nucleate two new particles. Okay? And 
obviously there is something wrong here, right? Because, you know, we've got this particular nucleus which is forming inside a particle that exists rather than in the matrix. So, if I add up all the dark blue regions, then I get an increment in volume which is not going to be correct. So, we call that the extended volume. Okay? Uh, we, we are allowing particles to grow into each other even though that's physically impossible. And the correction actually turns out to be incredibly simple. So, if I simply multiply the extended volume by the probability that newly transformed material falls in the parent phase, that gives me the correction. So, here we are. This is the wrong increment in volume, the extended volume. This is the real volume uh, increment. And this is the probability that the new material falls in untransformed matrix. Yeah. Can you see that? So, 1 minus the volume fraction of the transformed product, which is alpha, is simply the chance of finding untransformed austenite, right? Is everyone happy with that? If we now integrate the equation, that dV alpha is equal to 1 minus the volume fraction of alpha times the extended change in extended volume fraction of alpha, then we have dV alpha over 1 minus V alpha over V is equal to dV extended alpha uh, and integrate both sides. So, we get um, minus V into the logarithm of 1 minus V alpha over V is equal to the extended volume there and therefore uh, taking antilogs we get uh, uh, VE alpha over V and there's a minus sign and exponential 1 minus that is equal to V alpha over V. Okay, So, this is the... So, it's a very, very simple uh, correction which uh, solves the problem. So, clearly here there is an assumption and the assumption that we can take this probability to simply be the volume fraction of untransformed material and that means we are assuming that the particles are forming at random locations. Okay? So, obviously uh, grain boundary nucleation is heterogeneous nucleation and is non-random. Uh, but we can we can deal with that as well. I'm not going to go into that uh, in this lecture, but you can find all the theory to deal with non-random nucleation as well. Okay, uh, now if you are watching uh, transformation happening, so you've got these uh, crystals of austenite, and you're forming particles. They're not starting from the same value of time, so this particular particle started first and we are going to assume for the sake of uh, this that growth rate is constant. Uh, that has grown to a bigger size than a particle which formed at a later stage, right? Yeah, so, if you are observing this uh, happening, then the particle uh, which has nucleated at time equals tau 1 uh, will, will then grow in the next step and we will get the second particle nucleating in the next step and so on and so on. So, they are not all going to be of the same size when we look at uh, the material. So, what will be the volume of a particle which has nucleated at time tau 1? We are assuming a spherical particle. The volume of a particle as a function of time when it's nucleated at time tau 1. Yep. Yeah. Uh, cubed. Yeah. It's a volume, right? So, 4 over, uh, 4 over 3 pi growth rate cubed into T minus tau cubed, right? Because the particle doesn't exist before the uh, time gets to 
a value tau, right? So that's the volume of a particle that has nucleated at a time tau. So the volume of a particle which is nucleated at a time tau is equal to 4 upon 3 pi g cubed, where this is the constant growth rate. multiplied by t minus tau cubed, because the particle doesn't actually exist before the time t reaches the value tau. Uh, and therefore, the change in extended volume of alpha will be the volume of a particle nucleated at a time tau, multiplied by the number of particles that form during the interval d tau. So this is the nucleation rate per unit volume. Nucleation rate per unit volume. Multiplied by the total volume. Multiplied by the interval d tau. So this term basically tells you how many particles nucleate in the interval d tau. And uh, the nucleation rate, we'll assume, is constant. Okay. So if I replace dv extended alpha by uh, the usual um, term, which is um, dv extended alpha is related to dv alpha divided by 1 minus V alpha over V. So the, the actual increment in volume fraction of oh, this term is equal to 4 upon 3 pi G cubed, the nucleation rate, the total volume, and T minus tau cubed D tau. So I can now um, integrate both sides from here. These terms are constant. And here we are doing um, time equals 0 to time equals tau. So that becomes minus v log 1 minus v alpha over v into 4 upon 3 pi g cubed nucleation rate per unit volume times that into t equals 0 to t equals tau of minus tau to the power of 4 over 4, which is equal to um, 4 upon 3 pi g cubed nucleation rate per unit volume times the total volume into uh, t to the fourth upon 4 and I'm getting rid of this minus sign, um, this minus 4. Okay, so now we have a complete relationship between the real volume of alpha, the volume fraction of alpha, the growth rate, the nucleation rate, total volume, and time. And this is known as the Avrami exponent. Exponent. Now, in this particular case, we are, the exponent is 4 because the 3 comes from the growth of the particle, the, the volume of the particle. Uh, t minus tau cubed gives us 3. And 1 comes from the fact that we are multiplying the constant nucleation rate by a time interval. So this, this derivation here is for a constant growth rate. Rate of G, spherical particle, and constant nucleation rate. That gives us an Avrami exponent of 4. Okay. So uh, a constant growth rate growth rate and a constant nucleation rate gives us an Avrami exponent 
of 4. That's the exponent on time. Now, supposing that we have a situation in which we have diffusion control growth, controlled growth, where the volume varies with is proportional to time to the 3 upon 2 because, you know, the dimension of the specimen changes uh, parabolically with time. And we have a constant nucleation rate. Then the Avrami exponent would be 5 upon 2, t to the 5 upon 2. Uh, on the other hand, if we had, um, uh, again, spherical particles, um, but there is no need for any nucleation, the transformation starts from a fixed number of nucleation time, uh, sites at time zero. Okay, so constant growth rate uh, starts from a fixed number of sites at time zero. Then the Avrami exponent would only have the growth term. It would be t cubed. It would be 3. So the point I'm making is that if you make measurements of overall transformation kinetics and you determine the Avrami exponent by fitting to the equation we derived, then basically it gives you a clue about the mechanism by which the transformation is happening. So for example, in this case, we have a constant growth rate, constant nucleation rate. Here we have diffusion control growth. And in this case, we are starting the transformation from a fixed number of sites. Now, you have to exercise care because the exponents can be ambiguous. You know, two different mechanisms might give you the same exponent. So you back it up with other data, for example, metallography, etc. So this is called the Avrami equation. And if I write um, yeah, so I'll just go through that again. So extended volume is related to the volume of a particle which is nucleated at a time tau times the nucleation rate per unit volume times the volume and the interval in which we nucleate. And when we convert that to real volume, we end up with that. And I'm just replacing psi uh, for V alpha over V. That means it's the volume fraction. And we end up with a very simple equation here that the volume fraction will vary with 1 minus exponential of this term. So the t to the fourth, uh, obviously the cube comes from the growth because we are dealing with a spherical particle and it's growing in all three dimensions. And where does the remaining time come from? Because we've got t to the fourth instead of t to the third. Nucleation. Nucleation, okay. So you can think of it like this, all right, that We have a um, spherical particle, particle, therefore volume varies with t to the cubed and we are assuming a constant nucleation rate right so the nucleation rate leads to time and therefore overall rate has time exponent four okay so that we call the Avrami exponent the time exponent all right so this is called the Avrami exponent Okay, so suppose that growth is diffusion controlled. Growth 
is diffusion controlled. What do you expect the Avrami exponent to be? So, we are still assuming constant nucleation rate. What would you expect the Avrami exponent to be? Yep. Um, so, in diffusion control growth, how does the dimension of the particle vary with time? Half. Half, yeah. So, what would it be? 3.5. Hmm? 3.5. Uh, 1.5. Yeah, 2.5. Yeah, because uh, 3 upon 2 will be how the volume of the particle scales and 1 for nucleation rate. Yeah, so a Ramney exponent will be um, 5 upon 2. Yeah, so particle volume is proportional to time to the 3 upon 2. Okay. Now, suppose we have a constant growth rate, constant growth rate. And all particles start at exactly the same time. In other words, we don't need to worry about nucleation, right? So, all particles start instantaneously from a number of nucleation sites, all right? Then what do we expect the Avrami exponent to be? Three, yeah? because uh, we are only dealing with growth. So, that would be T cubed. Now, you can examine many different scenarios and the point of this is that when you ma make experimental measurements and from that you fit that Avrami equation that we had and get the Avrami exponent, that gives you information about the mechanism as well. Whether, you know, significant nucleation is required or do they all start instantaneously as soon as you reach the isothermal transformation temperature or is it diffusion control growth or is it a constant growth rate. So, simply by doing a measurement in a dilatometer for example, uh, where you know dimensional changes give you the fraction of transformation, uh, you can determine the mechanism. However, there is ambiguity. So, you could get an exponent uh, an exponent of 3 for two different scenarios. Right? So, it just helps you to narrow down and you need to combine with microstructural and other information to deduce the actual mechanism. Right? So, if you look in Christian's theory of transformation, there is a whole table uh, defining what exponents we should get for different scenarios. Okay? So, by looking at uh, the Avrami equation uh, and uh, examining experimental data, you, you can determine the Avrami exponent and therefore get some information about the mechanism of transformation. Now, the shape of these curves is, is like so. Why do you think that the reaction is slow at first? You know, it, it's sort of going like this. Why does it start off slow? There's very few nuclei to start with. Yeah. You need nuclei to start with and when they are tiny, when they grow, you know, the amount of material that we are adding is still quite small, okay? And why do you think it tends to level off after a while? Impingement, Impingement and you are running out of parent phase, aren't you? Yeah. yeah? Uh, now, we can generate curves like these for various temperatures and on the uh, axis, uh, vertical axis, you've got volume fraction. So, at any constant temperature, you know how much volume fraction you have. 
and therefore you can plot your time temperature transformation diagram okay so that's the calculation of the time temperature transformation diagram here uh, you, you can define these curves for whatever volume fraction you're interested in or for a whole range of volume fractions the same equation applies is everyone happy with that so um, this is a by the way but notice that the horizontal axis is log time right because you know your Avram equation tells you that uh, things will change with uh, logarithm of time so if you want to do an experiment in which you want to look at precipitation as a function of time by putting it into a furnace and withdrawing different samples at different times it doesn't make sense to take one out at one seconds the other one is two and third one at three and four you you take a logarithmic increment and that way you would minimize the amount of work that you need to do right okay um, life is never as simple as this that you have one transformation happening uh, alone you might get two different transformations uh, happening you know perlite and ferrite so how do we modify this equation to take account of alpha and beta Exactly, exactly. And, and we will also need two equations, okay? Um, so, you know, here we are. This is the one equation for alpha, that the change in the volume fraction of alpha is related to the extended volume fraction of alpha, but when we work out the amount of untransformed material, we have both V alpha and V beta, and we really need two equations here. Now, trust me that it becomes difficult to integrate those both analytically all right but it, that's not a problem you know you just implement it numerically and you change the volume fraction by a little bit and look at what happens you can at the same time implement soft impingement by modifying the composition of the matrix by mass balance right so these are coupled equations which you can easily solve numerically and implement in uh, computer programs and you do not need to tell these equations that look alpha should start at this temperature and beta should start at this temperature and this time everything happens naturally that means you simply allow the system to transform there's a driving force for alpha precipitation a driving force for beta precipitation they are competing for nucleation sites all that happens completely naturally in the system you don't have to put any empirical parameters to say you know perlite should start at this temperature if it, if it if it doesn't want to start it won't start you know because you are above the eutectoid temperature okay so so this is a very elegant and a very simple modification of our Rami theory to take account of two reactions and frequently we have six different reactions happening when we temper martensite you get a huge variety of carbides forming and we've done these calculations over a period of uh, for, for heat treatment lasting 40 years because in power plant the steels are creep resistant steels okay? they contain uh, minute alloy carbide precipitation of various kinds and those precipitates must uh, survive and provide the creep strength over a period of 40 years at something like 565 degrees centigrade and 100 megapascal stress now how uh, you know I've, I have actually been in this department for 40 years but I haven't been doing a thermal treatment for 40 years so how do I actually validate the calculations there's plenty of power plant around right so you go there and you what, what's known as tree panning so you you get a little bit of material out from the power plant and then you put it in the microscopes and study yeah so you have 40 year heat treatments available to you so here for example we've got alpha and beta 
forming together, they are clearly forming at different rates and different amounts have evolved over a period of time. Okay. Uh, now this uh, is slightly different because we are no longer doing isothermal transformation. This is continuous cooling transformation and you can see that when I vary the cooling rate, uh, I get different volume fractions of the transformation products. And we are not telling the ferrite here to form first or the perlite to form first. Everything is in principle allowed to form. Whether or not it forms is, uh, is there enough driving force, etc. Okay? And if I, if I change my austenite grain size to give a, a greater uh, nucleation rate, then everything changes quite dramatically. Okay? Now, I'm going to uh, give you uh, an example of the application of all this and of course this is one part of the problem you, you've got to calculate properties etc so a few years ago uh, four years ago uh, BP uh, came to us and they said look we, we we need to build undersea structures they already build them but now for much more severe conditions so these components are very large and they're located on the seabed and uh, the current steels which are used will no longer be capable for future uh, equipment that they want to put onto the seabed. And of course uh, the problem is uh, quite complicated because you have a whole range of properties to satisfy uh, and these components are huge, okay? massive. So you're talking about tons of, of material. And if you do a finite element calculation of how the cooling rate should vary, and this, this is a large component, then you'll see that it's by no means homogeneous. Okay? So a as this cools down, this is uh, actually a calculation done by Steve Oy. Uh, you can see that it's not going to be uniform. Right? So whatever steel you design has to be capable of producing the right structure over that whole range of cooling rates. Okay? Otherwise, you know, you will be you will run into difficulties. And because it's an undersea application, uh, the components are coated heavily for protection against corrosion, but nevertheless it's not perfect. So hydrogen gets into the steel, right? And as you make the steel stronger, the susceptibility to hydrogen increases. So the we want to make it much stronger than the steels that are currently used and therefore we will, it, it should be even more sensitive to hydrogen embrittlement. So what you do or what we did was we designed a hydrogen resistant steel and it's hydrogen resistant in the following sense. You see those very tiny vanadium carbide particles. Okay? Those are small, they have strain fields around them uh, so what, what you see is a particle is not really a particle but the strain field contrast that you see around the particle. Okay? And that strain field traps the hydrogen atoms. Right? So if hydrogen gets in, it's localized over there and it's only diffusible hydrogen that does damage. Okay? So a large number of experiments have now been done to prove that this concept works. Okay? But this is not isothermal transformation. This is continuous cooling transformation. So how, to, you know, the calculations that we've done are not strictly relevant because we are cooling over a range of temperatures, right? So here's the approximation that we use. Uh, say we have our two C curves from um, the time temperature transformation diagram. This is for 5% transformation. We assume that, look, if I'm transforming at this particular temperature for this time interval, in other words, I'm converting my continuous cooling curve into a series of isothermal steps. Okay? So if I'm transforming at this temperature for delta Ti, and this is the time Ti, then I've only achieved a fraction, delta Ti over Ti, at that temperature. When that fraction becomes 1, I actually have achieved 0.05 of transformation. Is everyone clear about this? Yeah. Uh, so the rule is that 
I take my continuous cooling curve, I divide it into isothermal steps. When the increments delta T i over T i equals 1, I've achieved that 0 0.05 of transmission. So you then convert your time temperature transmission diagram into an isothermal transmission, uh, into a continuous cooling transmission diagram. So on the left, uh, left hand side, you've got the isothermal transmission diagram. On the right hand side, you've got the corresponding continuous cooling transmission diagram. And if I superimpose, uh, just for clarity, I'll do it for the lower part. Then you can see that the continuous cooling transmission is extended over a much larger uh, te um, temperature range than the isothermal transmission diagram. Okay? So the red one is what you need, in fact, for large components which are not uh, possible to treat isothermally. Okay. Right now, um, I'm going to show you a movie which cost twenty thousand pounds to make. All right, uh, and it's made by BP, and some of it uh, is a little bit. Uh, it might make you smile, but there is some technical content in it. Okay, um, and unfortunately, I don't know how to link this to the to the sound system. And this is uh, the story about this particular undersea structure. And you know, uh, the task involved is huge. So we work in something called the International Center for Advanced Materials, which involves Cambridge, Manchester University, Imperial College, and Urbana-Champaign in Illinois. So that's called ICAM, International Center for Advanced Materials. So Manchester, for example, did all the experiments to prove that the concept uh, of uh, hydrogen resistance actually works. Can you hear? ICAM encompasses everything from fundamental research that will not immediately go through the marketplace, but it also has more applied projects. You might know him. How do you develop materials that are useful? So this is all in our department, okay? The university fundamental work is there to create, in a sense, new knowledge, new materials. Those are the part 1A crystalline. Deep water development is a very, very important so part of BP upstream business. She's an engineer, the and she defined for us all the parameters. So far, we were exploiting reservoir up to 15 psi pressure. So within BP, we have project 20k, which is aiming at accessing the reservoir with a 20 psi pressure. This poses a challenge in terms of the mechanical properties of the equipment. We need to have material that can withstand this, uh, this, this environment. There's a limit to how strong the material can be. We have reached this limit and now what we need is to go stronger. And there's just nothing that exists at the moment for this harsh condition. So if we want to be able to access new reservoir, we will need new materials. One of the most exciting projects is the hydrogen embrittlement. We are after strong materials. Strong materials are particularly sensitive to hydrogen. Hydrogen will enter the steel by one way or another. Corrosion is an electrochemical process on components which are submerged. And if you put a current which reverses that process, then you stop corrosion. Then the hydrogen gets in. And even though the concentration of hydrogen might be one part per million, that has a dramatic effect on the mechanical properties of the steel. So the goal is to design a way of capturing any hydrogen that gets into the steel and stopping it from migrating to regions where it would do harm. We have quantitative mathematical models. So that's what we've studied today. To address some of the variables. But these models are not sufficiently sophisticated. So what we do then is we make about 60 grams of material and we assess whether the models are in the right direction. After the computer modeling, we create our first nail composition. What I got here is a mixture of pure element. What Kelvin is doing now is to melt all these elements together and make 
mix it all up. We're going to perform a heat treatment and then we cut it all up. One piece is to go for chemical composition measurement, the other to be measure the hardness. This equipment will separate out the hydrogen, oxygen and nitrogen and then we can measure the amount of hydrogen inside the steel. When we first realized one of the alloy work to the specification, I'm very excited, but you know that more work has to be done. Things look good. We have demonstrated we can not only trap the hydrogen, but actually reduce the motion of hydrogen through the steel. It's great when there's a good result. It's terrific, but until we go to the nine ton component, we cannot actually risk saying that this is successful but the point is you know the indicators are all in the right direction all new ways of making materials have evolved to really make innovative research advances you need to bring something new a new technique a new approach it's an enabler so if we haven't got this alloy we don't have the technology to exploit offshore condition reservoir. The ICANN project is uh, focusing on the fundamental science and sometimes it's a bit difficult to, to see from an industrial perspective the interest of doing fundamental science. All the academics I've worked with have shown really excellent expertise, very brilliant people focusing on That's developing you guys, yeah. solutions. Yeah. In 10 years' time, when this alloy will be available on the market and will enable access to new reservoirs, then we can look back at all the work done in ICANN and think that well, it was worthwhile. So, the point is, you know, you saw those calculations, you know, uh, very briefly. Those were calculations of time temperature transformation diagrams for the precipitation of the alloy carbides. And BP is of course not a steel producer nor is it a component producer. So we now have uh, an association with uh, uh, Sheffield Forge Masters and a steel maker to make these nine ton components and that will be the ultimate test. So this is actually research in progress although our part is finished. Okay, okay thank you very much. <coughs>